Welcome to Indo Battery, where we are sharing our endometriosis journey and learning along the way. This podcast is in no way meant to diagnose or give medical advice, but a place where you can gain knowledge and information that can help you to not feel alone as well as become your best advocate. We want to learn with you and support you wherever you are in your journey. Thanks for joining us. I'm Shelby. And I'm Alana, and we're Indo Battery, charging our life when Indo drains us. Welcome back to Indo Battery. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have Dr. LaRiche with us. He is a urologist who focuses in endometriosis care. So thanks for coming on, Dr. LaRiche. If you want to kind of give us a little background of what all you do. Thank you, guys. It's so nice to see you again. Uh, we last saw each other at the Endo Summit yes. in Florida. So really mm-hmm. nice to see you uh, your faces again. So my name is Yaniv LaRiche. I'm the Chief of Urology Surgery at Barnabas Health in Jersey City, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health in Jersey City, New Jersey. And my focus professionally is on endometriosis and the urinary tract in both form and function, meaning I specialize in the reconstruction of the urinary tract that's been affected by endometriosis. And I also specialize in restoring normal function to the urinary organs once they've been affected. Yeah, it was interesting when you, because you were talking about the summit, which by the way, was probably the most fun that we've had in a long time. I don't know about you, but we came home and our stomachs still hurt from laughing. So and our cheeks were cramping. Yeah. That's good. I know. know. We did something well. Right. (laughs) You did an actual panel on this specifically. And what are some of the things that you notice for those that when you're going into surgery and you know that you're going to have an involvement in that surgery, what are some things that maybe the patient describes that cues you guys into? Yes. So I typically get involved whenever the patient complains of urgency, like that when they got to go, they got to go. Frequency, meaning they're going more often than their peers. Nocturia, meaning they're waking up in the middle of the night. Feelings of incomplete emptying of the bladder, whether that's perceived or not, meaning whether that's perceived or simply fact is irrelevant. If they feel like they're not emptying the bladder, that's a problem. Urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence. And, you know, it's funny if you ask anybody with endometriosis if they have urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence, the answer is always no. Mm. No, nope, I don't have it. But if you ask them, you know, do you wear a pad every day? Yeah. Mm. Is the pad wet at the end of the day? Yeah. (laughs) No, but that's just discharge. No, no, it's not. You know, there's something else going on there. Or fecal incontinence, you know, do you you have a hard time getting clean after you finish pooping? Do you have to wipe a thousand times to get clean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so we, we have sort of a set number of questions that we ask to sort of figure out who needs to be involved in, in a case if it's particularly challenging. And uh, obviously that's, that's part of the battery of testing, uh, mm-hmm. of questioning that we do. You know, as you know, the problem with endometriosis is uh, among the many problems with endometriosis. One of the biggest challenges with endometriosis is that there's no test. Mm-hmm. Um, short of the surgical intervention, right? There's no gold standard test. Mm-hmm. And so if you don't ask the right questions, it's very hard to get a good intuition or sense that the patient may have it. And the questions are, you know, they're difficult to, to sort of get to the bottom of, especially if the patient's been poo-pooed by, by a doctor a thousand times or, or by right. a thousand doctors a thousand times. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's challenging. But I will say that, that that's typically how I get involved is if we feel that there's a problem functionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, of course, if we have imaging that demonstrates, you know, obstruction or frank uh, involvement of the urinary tract, whether it's in the ureters or in the bladder, then of course, you know, my involvement is reconstructive in nature. Mm-hmm. Right. What do you um, see though after when you, so you get in there, you do all the work. Are there issues that some of these patients have after that reconstruction? Yeah. Look, you know, every surgery, there's, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? right. And so, you know, to think that we can do surgery without having uh, some trade-off is intellectually dishonest. Mm-hmm, right. Okay. So you can have somebody who has horrific 10 out of 10 pain 
29 out of 30 days a month and fix that. Mm -hmm. But that might come at a cost of, you know, not emptying your bladder well. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. If the, if the nerves are involved and you have to remove the nerves that, that govern bladder function in order to get relief of pain, you're going to sometimes see that. Right. And that's something that needs to be dealt with. Right. You know, same thing with uh, defecatory dysfunction. It's a similar sort of problem. You know, obviously we, the way that we do surgery and, and I'm part of two, you know, expert, expert groups and in, in working with Dr. Vidali and Dr. Liu, you know, we, we preserve nerves and, and mm-hmm. we do, we do a really, really nice job of, of sort of limiting the negative sequelae of surgery. Right. Right. But we also oftentimes see cases that are second opinion, third opinion. They've already mm-hmm. had two or three mm-hmm. surgeries. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes the damage is already done. Right. Yeah. And now now the job is to sort of undo the, the effects of a hurricane after it's gone through. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Rebuilding after a hurricane goes through is is not simple. Building the buildings right the first time is is a much better way yes. <laughs> of dealing and, with the hurricane. That's gonna and I feel through. like we hear that from, you know, many excision endo specialists is first surgery can be one of the most crucial surgeries if done right for this reason. Because if if you go in and things are a hurricane and haven't been done right, when a true expert gets in there, the likely ability to be able to fully help them maybe like you would have if you got to them sooner, you know, could vary. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. I mean, look, uh, I just took care of a lady um, who had, you know, endometriosis surgery by a general gynecologist and they, they basically burned her ureter and knocked it off. She basically proceeded to have, you know, stents placed and exchanged in her ureter for eight months, right. By a urologist and and this gynecologist. Mm. So she finally showed up and she needed a a formal reconstruction. And, you know, of course, Mm. when we went in to reconstruct, she still had all of her endometriosis there. So mm-hmm. it ended up being a true extirpative surgery to remove all the endometriosis and then a reconstruction, right? Mm-hmm. The reconstruction is rarely the reason why we go in. It's it's usually, you know, part of a much larger uh, sort of intervention. Mm-hmm. But that patient, right, had she had the right surgery in the first place, probably would not have needed the reconstruction because we right. wouldn't have burned her ureter right. and would have had a complete extirpation of her disease, right? Mm-hmm. Where the chances of recurrence are in the single digits percentage mm-hmm. wise, mm-hmm. right? as opposed to somebody who has surgery and eight months later is still dealing with their initial problem without sort of any resolution. It's kind of like when your kid gets gum in their hair and you try to dig it out <laughs> and there's people who actually can get it out better or a parent who just goes in with scissors and cuts it, out. cuts it out. And it's like, it's, I feel like it's very similar because it's a sticky thing or it makes it stickier or, you know what I'm saying? Like it has that effect yeah. of like cutting the well, hair. Yeah. Oh, no, the analogy is you either, yeah. Or it's the opposite, right? Somebody right. comes in to remove these three little hairs that are stuck to a, a piece of gum and end up shaving the person's entire head. Mm-hmm. And you go, well, what was the point of that? You know, that, that seems unnecessary. Just yeah. in case right? they so, have lice. You know, su- surgery is, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Su- surgery, is a, surgery is a delicate balance, right, of doing just enough but not too much. Right. Yes, right. In order, to, you have to do a job well done, but it can't be overly done. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's the art of medicine and the art of surgery is sort of getting a, a good sense of what that is, a good gestalt of what that means. Right. And it takes a long time to get there. You know, I, I don't think n- nobody was born with a robotic console in their hand and the knowledge mm-hmm. of how to do surgery immediately. You have to be really well trained and exposed to thousands of cases to really get good. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the irony here, right, is that it takes forever to, yep. to become really, really good unless you're at, at a center of excellence where you're seeing, you know, that volume day in, day out. Mm-hmm. And then you get good really quickly. But if you think about the general gynecologist, you know, they're not they're not going to the OR all that often. Right. They're not truly trained in in 
excisional surgery. I mean, mm-hmm. forget excisional surgery. How about we just get them to do a laparoscopy first? A right. Diagnostic right. Laparoscopy. Even mm-hmm. that is a challenge, right? <laughs> right. So, yep. So, you know, and then, and then forget about urologists. Urologists mm-hmm. have zero, zero knowledge of the disease state. Zero. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um, you know, and, and, and the, ironically, the urologists have a great opportunity to intervene because many patients with endo will come to the urologist's office and say, hey, I have frequency urgency nocturia. I have blood in the urine. I have urinary, oh, my favorite, urinary tract infections, right? I've had oh, 45 yes. urinary tract infections this year. And you go, okay, mm-hmm. uh, let me see a culture, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And there isn't a single positive culture. Yep. But What's, if the urologist doesn't yeah. say, okay, let me see the culture, guess what? They're going to have 41 uh, yep. or 40, you know, if they had 45, now they'll have 46 <laughs> you it's, know, UTIs. Because it's, it's not hard to, to be a good doctor if you're intellectually curious and sort of stimulated by the, the puzzle solving. Right. But if you're a machine that's just, you know, that needs to see 40 or 50 or 60 patients in a day, how could you ever have the bandwidth to be intellectually curious? It's just mm-hmm. impossible. Right. Well, it's interesting that uh, you I say that, though, not. because yeah. when I before I was 18 at the time and I was seeing a doctor and he's like, I don't know why you keep having blood in your urine and we don't we can't figure this out. I cannot tell you how many urine urine samples I had to give. I became very proficient. It was like twice a week at one point because they could not figure this out and they were trying to test my levels. And then he still was like, I don't know. I think you have a urinary tract infection. Mm-hmm. Why are why is there so much blood in your urine? And and now looking back, I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe that's why, because yeah, I haven't had one in a long time. Right. And you had, and look, that was at age 18, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So fr- from that moment, how many years did it take for you to get a diagnosis of endo? From that point, it was eight or nine Eight or nine years. Mm-hmm. So look at the missed opportunity there, right? right mm-hmm. To get right. the diagnosis and treat you and, and prevent all of the stuff that comes from having endometriosis for nine right. years. Mm-hmm. Instead, you know, I got a um, cancer diagnosis or a potential yeah. cancer diagnosis. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that doesn't take a mental toll at all. No, you know, to get not it. at all. <laughs> Be told, you know, make your arrangements. I mean, right. come on, it's ridiculous. Yeah. When, when, you know, if that urologist would have said, you know, you're 18, I'm sure at the time you were probably having some cyclical pain. I'm sure that mm-hmm. those UTIs were probably related, right? Yep. UTI-like symptoms, they weren't real UTIs. Right. And when he saw that there were never a positive culture, maybe that should have been a good indication to say, you know, I know that I'm living in my little urology box, right, where I'm mm-hmm. not supposed to stray left or right, but maybe I should call one of my colleagues to think right. about an alternative diagnosis. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I think that that makes me a prayer breed in, in my line of work is that right. I really enjoy uh, sort of working as part of a multidisciplinary team. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in fact, in my opinion, the more, the more experts you have taking care of you, probably the care that you're going to get is going to be a little bit better. Right. right? Yep. Because everybody brings their own uh, knowledge base and, and understanding of a disease process. And the sum of all of those opinions together mm-hmm. ends up getting you a much better sort of clinical result. Exactly. So to me, you know, could I do endometriosis surgery on my own? Probably. I mean, you know, right. I, I did two years of general surgery before I did urology. Right. So, uh, as many urologists do, right. um, and so you know the technical aspects are not are not uh, insurmountable. But to me, if you have an expert gynecological surgeon, an expert urologist, an expert um, cardiothoracic surgeon, an expert general surgeon, mm-hmm. an expert colorectal surgeon, an expert vascular surgeon, right, collaborating mm-hmm. um, on a complex case the chances of that complex case becoming solvable are much better than if it's a go it alone type situation. Mm -hmm. As we, because everybody has their own, uh, everybody has their limitations. Look, Mm -hmm. you know, if you ask my wife, she'll tell you I have plenty, plenty. (laughs) We all have our limitations. Don't we all, but some people don't recognize theirs 
as well. And that's, I think, part of the issue also within the medical field is that so many people have such a big ego that they think they're the best and they won't pass the buck even on the hard cases. So they'd go in and do a disservice rather than, you know, hey, this is fully out of my scope. Here are these names and these people. And I think that's where it gets tricky with endo for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, look, look at the world of urology and its involvement with endometriosis, right? There isn't any. No, no. Truly there isn't any. It's you. Uh, That's despite the (laughs) fact that I think it's more than 50% of patients have urinary tract, either dysfunction or urinary tract involvement. Mm -hmm. And rectal, rectum too, I think, you know, I've, like you said earlier, I think, you know, the constipation or diarrhea piece is a huge. Of course. We hear it all the time. Right. So like you look at that and you go, well, you know, why is it that no urologist is involved in this care? Mm -hmm. And the answer is the doctors who would be best at treating voiding dysfunction and defecatory dysfunction want nothing to do with endometriosis surgery. Mm. It's true. You know, urogynecologists want nothing to do with endometriosis. Why is that? Because urogynecologists do uh, have a specific subset of operations and and patient sort of profiles Mm. that they are seeing, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So they're much more likely to see somebody with prolapse or Mm. somebody with stress incontinence or even urinary incontinence of, of, of the urgent type. Right. From like bladder spasm. But they're not going to go beyond that and say, hey, you know, why would a 22 year old have urge urinary incontinence? That's sort of odd. Mm -hmm. Let's think about that for a second. Right. That that part doesn't exist. They don't want to investigate things. They want to know what they know and they want to just be able to get in, get out, do what they can. Well, I don't know if it's get in, get out. I think I think you said it right. They they know what they know and they don't know what they what they don't know. Right. And. To me, I think that the way that you bridge the gap over the stuff that you don't know is to collaborate with colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the collaborative spirit in medicine is sort of an unusual, as you alluded to, it's sort of unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of egos. There's a lot of stake claiming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you if you put that aside and you say, well, what? What did I get into medicine for in the first place is to serve the patient. Mm-hmm. And how would the patient best be served? That's by collaborating. You sort of get over that real quick. Yeah. In the and healing. That's, you know, that's something that, that, you know, to Dr. Vidali's credit and to Dr. Liu's credit and to really uh, a lot of the doctors at the end of summit, I think, I think they all sort of appreciate that and get that and, and mm-hmm. really believe that a collaborative multidisciplinary approach is, is the way to go. All Agreed. of them say it. Yep. All of them do, yeah. We've talked about the process of reconstruction, but we also have to touch on the healing because I think you and Shelby were talking about the effects of the urinary tract and SIBO, how they correlate. If you if your nerves are if your nerves are shot, then your nerves are shot, right? Right. So I, I think what I'm sort of known for saying is if you had a knee replacement or a hip replacement, right, it mm-hmm. would be it would be a departure from the norm to not send you to a physical therapist for rehabilitation. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Departure from the norm, like mm-hmm. that, would be really unusual. Mm-hmm. Right. But in pelvic surgery, we just do pelvic. We do massive pelvic <laughs> surgery, and then you know, there's no physical therapy. You're on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a, you know, that's, that's a, that's a problem, I think. And I think as we recognize that surgery, even minimally invasive surgery, right, is still right. surgery. We still had to stab you five times to get all of our instruments in. Right. If you got stabbed jogging in the park, you know, you'd be laid up in an ICU and everybody, you'd have the right. news outside, right? Yep. Thing, you poor thing. But instead, you know, you just get stabbed five times in a controlled manner. That's fine. It's no big deal. Go back to work. Felt <laughs> right. great. Yeah. <laughs> You're fine. You know, so you Go know, home. I, I think that we we don't really surgeons in general don't really appreciate the assault, right? That we mm-hmm. the insult that we cause to the body. Mm-hmm. And you know, surgery again, it's another famous saying from one of my mentors. 
you know, surgery doesn't start in the operating room. It starts well beforehand. Mm -hmm. It continues in the operating room and it continues well after the operating room. Mm -hmm. Right. To have a mm -hmm. successful outcome. It, it really is a, it's a, it's a process. You can't, and you can't skip any of those parts, right. To have a good right. outcome. You have to have good prehab. You have to have good intraoperative technical skill and, and, and outcome. And then you right. have to have a good rehab mm -hmm. afterwards. Right. Yeah. And I think what we were talking about, which kind of goes back to all the UTIs that were diagnosed that weren't UTIs, you know, and so many endo patients have been on years of antibiotics for these said not UTIs that they had sure. been having. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we were kind of talking about, you know, with yeah, SIBO. Yeah, yeah, sure. And look, if you, if you, we know, right, yeah. there is good data. We know. When I say we, I mean, not just the three of us. I mean, the medical, <laughs> the medical community at large knows. Yes that there are significant changes to the gut microbiome mm -hmm. with a single dose of antibiotics. Yep. And some of those changes are forever changes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so to think that we can expose somebody to antibiotics 30 times a year mm -hmm. for 10 years and not have a change to the gut microbiome mm -hmm. in terms of SIBO, in terms of altering digestion in terms of uh, endo belly bloat all mm -hmm. those things you know it's sort of it's sort of wild to right, think right. that we can wipe you out with antibiotics and and everything's going to be just fine when it regrows in fact we know that that's not true right, right. yep so you know i think that the connection to SIBO is is uh, a real one mm -hmm. um can i prove that probably not <laughs> yeah but, but, you know, some things don't need to be proven to right. make logical sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the hard part is, is last year, almost a year ago, before I had my surgery this summer, I was admitted to the ER and I was sent home with antibiotics saying that I had a UTI. And, you know, I'm one that doesn't like taking antibiotics for all the reasons we're talking about, because it does mess with my gut. I do lots of stuff to reheal it if I've ever had to be on them. So they're like the last place I want to go. And so once I got home, they were like, yep, you have a UTI. Well, then the next day, the ER called me and was like, oh, actually, you don't have a UTI. So now you can stop taking your antibiotics. And I was so furious because mm -hmm. for two days, I took antibiotics and also pooped my brains out because that's what antibiotics do to me. And I was so furious. Like I didn't even know what to say. I was just like, thanks and hung up because I was infuriated that if that's what they're going to do, they should wait and say, Hey, you know, it's going to take 24 hours to run this culture or further culture. We'll call you tomorrow. And if you do have a UTI, then start tomorrow instead of having a patient on antibiotics for two days. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's just, I mean, you know, so it's a challenge. Yeah, of course. Of course. And, you know, if you think about the number of people who have endometriosis and the number of ER and urgent care visits that they have specifically for, you know, lower pelvic pain. Mm -hmm. Right. And then they're told, oh, you know, you, you must have a UTI because, you know, why there can't be an alternative? I don't know. But that's what they say. <laughs> Right. You know, so think about how many people are getting antibiotics. I mean, it's just yeah. it's yeah, wild. It's, it's and just then you wild. become antibiotic resistant. And then I yep. think when you do actually end up having surgeries, are we seeing more infection because of that mm -hmm. resistance? I don't know. I mean, those that's all a hypothetical potential situation. I don't know. But I think it is an issue long term. I actually stopped taking most of the antibiotics because I was like, you know, it's not yeah. doing anything for me. I'm not going to I'm not going to take it, you know, and they kept giving it to me and I never took it. <laughs> I don't think that's great, but I didn't, it didn't help. So obviously why would I take it? Like why? I felt awful on it. So right. at that point I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm not the best person to talk about with this because <laughs> I, I you was dealt a lot with it. I've dealt a lot with it yep. and I was probably not the best patient. But you also or, didn't receive you know, the best care. Alternatively, maybe maybe you had more insight than your doctors did. Yeah, you know. Oh, so that's true. I'm not I'm not so sure that that's true. Right. You know. Yeah, you can't blame yourself when, again, like we've said, your doctor only knew so much, and right. you were there in pain. They didn't know more. Yeah, I mean, right. I'm I was just done with it, and I'm not yeah, a good patient. Fair. 
We all know. I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to that uh, philosophy of not maybe. a good patient. It's just not. That's not in my vernacular. What me telling you no is not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you telling me no signals to me that you have a set of ideas and opinions about something that, you know, needs to be worked through, mm-hmm. right, and talked through. And then ultimately, you know, the person who has agency over your body is not the doctor, it's you. Right. Mm-hmm. And so if you have a set of beliefs and ideas that we talk about, and you are convinced that, you know, what I'm telling you is right, then, then, you know, then you take what the doctor tells you. Right. But if you don't, that doesn't make you a bad patient. That's probably a doctor who wasn't able to convey the ideas in a way that was cogent and sufficiently explanatory right. mm-hmm. to either dissuade you from your wrong idea, right? Mm-hmm. Or to you know, may, maybe you're right, right? Sometimes the patient is right and the doctor's wrong. That's not, that's not a crazy thing to say. Yeah. Right. So I don't, I really, I really don't have that in my vernacular. There's no such thing as a bad patient. I, I, I don't believe in that. Yeah. Well, bad patient is one who punches the doctor in the face. That's, that's a that's bad patient. Bad patient. And, yep. And guess what? That's usually because the doctor deserves, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is true. Actually, there's a few times I've wanted to, but yeah, I held I back. I mean, I may be small, but I'm scrappy. Fists of fury. I'll use my eyes to no, fight but you. You instead. guys understand what I'm saying. They're, they're oh, yeah, totally. Absolutely. A, a bad patient. That, right. That's that's a that's a, an inability to communicate effectively between uh, a professional giving advice mm-hmm. and right. somebody who's asking for the advice. Yeah. So right. So so and, and I think that has a lot to do with. Um, Again, having the time to sit and and talk through mm-hmm. discordance between what the doctor's saying, what the patient's saying, I'm, and I'm not sure that that reflects anything about good, bad, or otherwise about the patient, right? No, right. I, I think that's, if anything, it probably reflects on the doctor. Well, and it also reflects on past trauma with doctors. So yeah. even if you try, a patient could be real resistant because of past traumas with mm-hmm. doctors, and I think. They're going to be, I mean, I know from, in my case, I am more resistant to listening to a doctor because I have in the past and it has not been beneficial for me to do so. So I think that there's a lot of hesitation with patients who have seen multiple doctors time and time again, different day, same answer, or that we're crazy or whatever the case may be. And so you get to a doctor who really, truly wants to help and it takes pulling out all the stops to get us to a place where we can trust that what you're saying is valid or that you know what you're talking about because of all the past trauma with doctors. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and part of that is founded and part of it is we kind of have to go in with an open mind too. So as a patient, mm-hmm. but that, I mean, that is the reality of why a lot of times I'm more stubborn with my care yep. and treatment. That's a whole nother can of worms that I don't think we have time to open up. So I'll leave it at that. But what are some ways that you find helpful for endometriosis patients in trying to alleviate some of these symptoms euro wise until a surgery or until they can find the specialist? Because not everyone has that accessibility right away, especially because we do have um, people from multiple different countries listening. Sure. What are some tips that you have from your standpoint that would be beneficial to help? Yeah. So, you know, I think that, you know, you don't necessarily need to see a specialist to treat. In other words, if you have overactive bladder or bladder spasm, right? Yeah. You don't need a specialist urologist who treats endometriosis to, to fix that right? Even temporarily to, to address it temporarily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a generalist can do that. Mm-hmm. What, what, what you need to be able to do though, is describe your symptoms in a way that conveys to the doctor who's seeing you, the generalist who's seeing you, of what you're facing. Mm-hmm. Now that's a tall order for a patient because the patient doesn't know what the doctor is trying to listen for. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So a good doctor knows how to sort of nudge you in the right direction and say, hey, tell me a little bit about X, Y, Z. 
right? Mm-hmm. So like my, my opening line is always, why don't you tell me a little bit about your bladder? Is it nice to you? Mm. And the answer is always, well, what does that mean? And I say, it means whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> you tell me. Yeah. And then, you know, and then, and then the floodgates open and you, no, no pun intended. And then you can <laughs> sort of learn. <laughs> that was a good one. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> joke 101. So <laughs> you can, uh, you sort of have to, it, it's a tall order for a patient, but, but I think that, um, if the majority of the symptoms that you're having are sort of, um, well, let, let me rephrase it this way. I think that if you can explain to the doctor in the most descriptive terms what mm-hmm. it is that you're feeling, uh, they should be able to put the picture together. What oftentimes happens, though, right, is you go into the doctor's office and um, the doctor has three minutes to talk to you. And they have an agenda that they want to push. And maybe you don't even get to say that part. So what I always tell patients is, I want you to come to the consultation, whether it's with me or anybody else, with a one-page executive summary, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. of what it is that's been happening with you. I, I don't want to hear, no, no fluff, right? Like mm-hmm. really bare bones stuff, bullet points where I can say, look, I wake up, you know, six times a night. I sleep, you know, during the day, I'm exhausted because I've been up all night peeing. I wake up Mm -hmm. six times a night. Oftentimes Mm -hmm. I can't, even though I feel like I really need to pee in the middle of the night, I get up, I go to pee, nothing comes out. And I ask myself, what's going on? Like, if I'm a generalist doctor and you hand me that piece of paper, right, even ahead of the appointment, and I get to see that, I go, oh, Oh, she's having nocturia, she's having urgency, she's having frequency. Yeah, we can put her on some overactive bladder medication. And mm. and it doesn't matter where in the world you are, overactive bladder medications exist and they're inexpensive. That's good. Uh, so, you know, I would say the, the most important thing is to be able to com- communicate effectively your, your symptoms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're coming in emotionally charged because of medical trauma, and you compound that with a doctor who's in a rush because they have another 45 patients to see. Right. There's no way that you're going to get your point across. Right. Yeah. So putting pen to paper and doing like an executive summary, I think, is really helpful and beneficial. That's yeah. a great point. Uh, in terms of strategies to help patients while they're awaiting surgery, I think, you know, overactive bladder medications are great. Um, I say that with a little caveat that some of the overactive bladder medications, uh, particularly the less expensive ones, can cause uh, constipation, mm, which okay. <laughs> uh, is a problem in our in our patient population. Yes. And so, so on that executive summary, in addition to writing down what's happening with the bladder, you can also say what's happening with the rectum. And then if I'm the urologist, even the generalist, or even a GP, mm-hmm. right, who sees, hey, this patient is having overactive bladder and bladder spasm, and she has incontinence, well, then this class of medications is not the right one, but right. this class of medications is. Yep. Right. 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 So overactive bladder medications are really broken down into two major classes of, of medications. You have the anticholinergics, which are the older class of medications. They've been around forever. They're very inexpensive. They exist worldwide. The side effect is constipation. The second class of medications uh, is a relatively newer class of medications. It's called the beta-3 agonists. Mm -hmm. There's really only two drugs in that entire category. One is called Gemtiza and one is called Merbetric or Merbegron. They do not have constipation associated with their side effect profile. So, you know, that's, I I would say that would be one thing that you could do. Pyridium, you know, if you have a lot of burning symptoms, Mm -hmm. when you you urinate, pyridium is, is a good drug, very inexpensive. Only downside is that it, it dyes the urine nuclear orange. <sighs> and so if that, if you have incontinence, right. uh, you know, it can stain clothing uh, and it can, can ruin a beautiful new toilet bowl. So you have to be sort of uh, diligent. <laughs> you just get a black goes. one, it's fine. <laughs> There's another medication called urogesic blue, which again, stays the, stains the urine, just this time blue in color. And that's also a nice, it can sort of coat the, coat the bladder and sort of make it a little less irritated. Um, Urogesic mm-hmm. blue is one, and then there's Urabel is another name. So, you know, there, there's all sorts, it depends on the symptom. Right. And I think, again, you know, any generalist should be able to 
pick up on on sort of what it is that you need as long as the symptoms are communicated clearly mm-hmm. and effectively. Right. Mm-hmm. And then probably always pelvic floor PT is always helpful. Oh, a hundred. Listen, I'm a Every big, single time. big believer in pre- prehab. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Prehab, good intra, good, good rehab. Yeah. You have to have all three. So yeah. yep. prehab is great. You know, I think that it's sometimes challenging to do pelvic floor PT if you have stage four endometriosis with like a, a fixed frozen pelvis, mm-hmm. you know, you can't, you know, sometimes pelvic floor PT requires internal work and that's right. not necessarily doable. Right. Um, and so, you know, just, just cause you can't do the PT doesn't mean that you've done something wrong or that you're not doing the right thing. It's just some people cannot tolerate it. Right. Yep. Right. Right. And for them, rehab is much more important than prehab. Yep. Yeah, right. but even getting a good what, baseline what, what, prior to surgery from the pelvic floor PT standpoint might be good, even if not much can be done, so that they know better what they're working with post surgery for the if rehab. If nothing can be done, that's a very important data point. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So if, if you go from being able to do nothing yep. to post surgical, you can tolerate internal work. Mm-hmm. That has big implications towards improvement in sexual function, urinary function, fecal function. There's a lot of good things that that happen if you transition from a full-blown impossible pelvic floor PT patient to someone who, oh, you know, we have someone to work with here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's all reasonable. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking your time out of your day. Thank you so much. Coming right out of surgery to see us and talk about this. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Until next time, Endo Battery, continue advocating for you and for those that you love.